Hello and welcome to MySQL. My name is Brian Pringle and I will be your instructor for this class. The purpose of this lesson is to learn what a database is, why you should use a database, what is contained in a database, what they look like, what a database management system or a DBMS is, how data is retrieved and stored, some history of SQL, and the different DBMSs that are out there and their pros and cons. The first thing you need to know is what a database is. A database is nothing more than just a collection of files that exist on a medium, such as a hard drive, CD drive, even old tape drives. They are stored in such a way that allows retrieval and updating of data to be done very efficiently, very quickly. You also need to be aware that a database and a spreadsheet are not the same thing. The main purpose of using a database is to reduce redundancy and errors. In the old days of computing, users would keep individual records on their individual computers they would store the records in places where they knew where they could find them, but the problem was that each person had their own copy of the data. So if I had some information about a customer, and that customer changed their address or the telephone number, and somebody else in the company knew that the change occurred but didn't tell me, then my copy didn't get updated, only the person that actually knew about it. So what would happen is the data was stored in these disparate locations, and it was frequently duplicated by multiple users, and changes didn't occur like they should. Not everybody had the most current version of the data. By using a database, now we can have all that data in one central location where all the users can access it. And now, if an update gets, uh, gets performed, everybody sees that change. So what's contained in a database? A database contains data. Some of the more commonly used parts of a database are tables, rows, which are also called records or tuples, columns, which are actually called attributes, stored procedures, views, user logins and roles, and other security things. Those are the basics. There are more that we'll cover throughout the course. So what is data? Data is the plural form of the singular noun datum. One datum is one value that is represented in the database. The data can be text, numbers, or even files, such as pictures, sound, and videos. You can actually embed a picture or a video or a sound file. Anything that's multimedia can be stored through the use of the same technology that we use for email messages, which is called MIME types. We can encode the data and actually store that inside of a database. So examples that can be used are things like a person's name, so we have Bob Smith, his phone number, his salary, his birth date, which if you notice the date is in the format of year-month-date, his address, his city, and his zip code. Now something to be aware of is a zip code is actually not a numerical value. A zip code includes the hyphen because in some areas you have to use the 5-4 format for a zip code, so we actually use that as text. We'll get to that more later. So what does a database look like? Okay, so there are different ways that we can represent a database. In a visual logical representation, like a Visio diagram or a network diagram or some sort of uh, relationship diagram, we would represent a database as something that looks like a silo. So this thing right here is actually what we would use to represent a, a database. Now we will be using what's called an entity relationship uh, diagram or an ERD and it looks more like this. You can also do this in Visio. We'll use some online services that will allow us to do the same thing. But this is a representation of a database table and what is stored inside of it. These are the column names. Now this is an ERD that represents the table that is down here. This is what it actually looks like when I pull up information out of the database. So when I look at information in the database, I will see things like a customer ID column, a store ID column, first name, last name, their email address, and so forth. Now to me, it looks like this table here. But in reality, behind the scenes, the database system may store it in some manner that doesn't even look like this. This is our view. This is what us humans see when we look at a database. We see tables. 
So how is the data stored? So behind the scenes, the database is nothing more than files on the hard drive. It can be stored in one file or multiple files. Some of our database systems will store each table in a separate file. Some of your database systems store them in two files. Some of them store it in just one file. It depends on which data database system we are using. It can be stored in one location on the drive. It could be stored in multiple hard drives or even in different computers in different locations. So I could actually have part of my database at one location and another part of my database at another location. And we use that for redundancy. We use it for things to make the database run faster, especially like if I have different warehouses, I could have part of the database at one warehouse with all of the items in it that are contained in that warehouse. And then the other part of the database for the other warehouse, that part of the database could be stored at the other part. But as far as the end users are concerned, they actually won't know that there's any difference. That's called transparency. And we will get to that later. So how the files are actually stored does not matter to us humans. It only matters to the computer. All we have to care is the data is there. The database management system, the DBMS, handles all of the behind the scenes work for us. We don't have to worry about how it's actually done. So there is this person called a database administrator, and the database administrator is also called a DBA. This is the person that is responsible for handling everything with the database. They're responsible for the logical and physical design of the database, which we will get to logical and physical design more in, in uh, future lessons. They are responsible for, figure, for figuring out which DBMS to use, what kind of modeling programs that we'll use, which we will touch on those later, what kind of data retrieval methods should be used, they're responsible for actually designing, implementing, and enforcing the security and roles, so we can actually lock down the database. They are responsible for maintenance of the database. So are things like backups, are things like recovery, that's all the responsibility of a DBA. They are responsible for optimization and performance tuning, which we will touch on in later lessons. They're responsible for training the users on how to use the system, what kind of data to put into the system, and then also on our life cycle, we are responsible for maintaining and evaluating the system to make sure that we're still using the one that works best for our environment. So throughout the use of a database system, we will continually have to check to make sure that another system may not better support our environment. So database design can actually be broken down into two major parts. There's logical design and physical design. Logical design is the part where I write down on a piece of paper or I use some sort of computer modeling program like Visio to actually design what I think the database should look like. Now we do this without regards to what the capabilities and limitations are of the particular DBMS that we are using. This is our first step in creating a database and we do this to get a general idea of what should be in the database. Now what will really happen though is after we do the logical design We'll start implementing it into the actual DBMS that we choose, and we'll find that some things may or may not work exactly the same as we thought that they should during the logical design, because we'll run into limitations. The system may have different capabilities than what we really expected to happen. So the physical design is taking what we designed in the logical process and actually implementing it into the production DBMS. When we do the physical design, that's when we have to worry about what the DBMS can actually support. So what is a database management system? A okay, database management system is nothing more than the program that is responsible for all of the interaction with the database files. In most database systems, the DBMS is the only thing that is allowed to touch the files. The files are actually typically locked in a, in a uh, database system. So that way the end users can't directly interface with the files. We can't do things like delete them. We can't even back them up because the DBMS has them locked down to that point where the DBMS has complete control over what happens to those files. The idea here is to prevent illegal access to those files. And illegal access doesn't just simply mean that we don't want a user in, but we don't want a user to make changes. We don't want somebody to accidentally delete it. So the user will want to get data out of the database somehow. Well, the only way that we can do that is by interfacing with the DBMS. So we will use some sort of client tools to actually allow us to gain access to the data. Now, in the majority of our current applications that we use, most of the stuff that you see is what's called a front-end 
um, front end interface, and that's going to be like a web page, or it's going to be some sort of console tools that come with the DBMS that we're using. We are typically using what is called a structured query language, or SQL. Now, my SQL is just one SQL database system. Uh, SQL is a standardized special purpose language for managing data in a relational database management system, RDM, RDBMS. Now, relational means that I'm putting data into the database that is related somehow. So I'm going to have a database that has to deal with my customers, or I may have a database that has to deal with my entire business. Um, and inside of there, I'll have tables that have things like customers and inventory and orders and stuff like that. The name was introduced in the 1960s by IBM. It was actually called SQL, uh, but they had to change it because it infringed on a UK-based aircraft company, and they lost a lawsuit, and they had to change the name. So they just simply changed it to SQL. The current implementation that we use, though, is not actually based on the IBM standards. It's based on standards by a man named Edgar F. Codd. You also hear him referred to as E.F. Codd. He wrote a paper in 1970 uh, called a relational model of data for large shared data banks. And in this paper, he actually wrote some rules and regulations for a process called normalization. And that process is actually what we still follow when designing a database system. And not the database system, but the actual database. Uh, in 1986, the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, approved SQL as a standard. And in 1987, it was, it was approved as a standard by the International Standards Organization, or ISO. SQL is a declarative language, but it does contain some procedural elements, so I'll tell you what that means. Um, we don't tell the system how to do things. We don't tell it how to find data or how to update data or anything like that. We just simply tell it to do it. You can think of SQL as a secretary. If I have a secretary and I ask him or her to get a telephone number for a customer or a name or an address or anything like that for a particular person, I don't necessarily care how the, the secretary gets the information. What I care is that they get the information to me. I care that they get it quickly and I want them to do it efficiently. I want it to be correct, but I don't have to tell them, go to the Rolodex or look on Google or look somewhere else to particularly find that that information, I just tell them to go find it. SQL works the same way. So I actually just simply tell the DBMS, hey, find the telephone number for this particular person, and the DBMS will give the information back to me without me having to tell it how to do it. So some of the commonly used DBMSs are Oracle. Oracle is going to be your top of the line. It is the most expensive. It is very robust. It is responsive. It is very fault tolerant. It is the most commonly used DBMS in the world right now. It's easily scaled, but once again, like I said, it's very expensive. Microsoft SQL Server is Microsoft's version. Now, this has to run on a Windows computer. It fully integrates with Windows Active Directory domain, which means that I don't have separate logins for user accounts. So once they, once they, once they authenticate to Windows, then they immediately have access to the DBMS. Once again, it's kind of expensive. MySQL, though, is open source. It is actually the most used open source RDBMS in the world. There are other ones out there like uh, PostgreSQL. There's uh, SQLite and then Microsoft Access, which Microsoft Access, while it's not very robust, it is still used frequently by little applications um, and also some websites still use it. So MySQL. It is the second most used RDBMS. Oracle is the first. Microsoft SQL Server is the third. Notice the first and the third are commercial applications. You have to pay for those. MySQL is open source, and it is the most used open source. It was first released in 1995. The authors were trying to find an alternative for proprietary systems that were deemed inefficient and inflexible. It was named after the daughter of one of the authors, and the daughter's name was My, so they decided to call it MySQL. So what are the pros and cons? All right, the very first pro is that MySQL is free for most people. There are commercial versions of it. Uh, the commercial versions of MySQL are going to be things for a company that wants to do proprietary work, and they want to ensure that 
the uh, the way that it works will never change. They can actually license that capability and they can also license support. MySQL is very easy to use. It follows most of the SQL, uh, the SQL standard, so it is real easy to pick up if you already understand SQL. It is community supported, which means that if I need help with something for SQL, there are all sorts of forums out there that I can go on and participate. I can ask questions. And anything that I ever need to know how to do, I can find somebody to help me with. Most of the time, that's free. There is a very large installation base, which means that they are very responsive to customers that need assistance or need changes. So the, the larger the amount of people that use the system, the more influence you have. It works on several operating systems. It works on Windows, Linux, Solaris. OS 10, so I can install it on a Mac, FreeBSD, and several others. The cons, though, uh, MySQL over the years has been wrought with stability and reliability issues. MySQL, you need to remember that it is a free open source application. Officially, it's not supposed to be supported in a production environment, but it is used by most businesses because it's free or inexpensive. It does not scale very well. So if I outgrow one MySQL server and I try to go to a second server, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get my application to run exactly the way that I want it to without losing some performance. Um, the development is not community driven. So the support is community driven, but the development is not. Now, what does this mean? This means that if I need a feature added or if the community as a whole wants to see something done differently, there is no way to force the company to make it. So here's the problem. Oracle acquired MySQL several years ago. Oracle is the most used commercial RDBMS. And they own a product called MySQL, which is open source, where they don't make a whole lot of money off it, so they're not extremely driven to make changes and to fix problems with it. They want the customers to use Oracle instead. So they're not necessarily in a big rush to make changes and to add features to it. They want you to move over to Oracle. So that's one of the cons. The last one is that MySQL is not fully SQL compliant. So what happens is there are certain commands that I may use in Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, or some, some other SQL system that may not be fully implemented in MySQL. In this lesson, you learned what a database is, why you should use a database, what is contained in the database, what a database looks like, what a database management system or DBMS is, how data is retrieved and updated, the history of SQL, some of the different DBMSs and their pros and cons.